Balance your trading strategy by adding futures. CME Group helps you manage risk and capture opportunities in all market environments. Capitalize on around-the-clock access to highly liquid global futures and options market across all major asset classes. Just visit your online broker and get started. Plug into valuable educational materials and trading tools and see what adding futures can do for you at cmegroup.com slash on the tape. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. In August of 1971, <laughs> Unbelievable. So good. I was seven years old, and the great band The Who released their fifth studio album, Who's Next?, I'm going to read you a lyric because this has been resonating in my mind for quite some time. By the way, you're listening to the On The Tape podcast. I'm Guy Adami, always joined by Danny Moses and Dan Nathan. And oh, by the way, Danny and I sat down with best-selling author Bethany McLean for a little Off The Tape segment. We'll be fighting in the streets with our children at our feet, and the morals that they worship will be gone and the men who spurred us on sit in judgment of all wrong. They decide, and the shotgun sings the song. The first lyrics from Won't Get Fooled Again. And I will tell you, folks, and Danny and Dan, the last week has got me to a point where I see what's going on, and I was fooled once, but I'm certainly not going to get fooled again because the data that continues to come out, the PPI number we saw earlier this week, the CPI number, the numbers we're seeing on the jobs front all suggest to me that this inflation that everybody seems to think is under control is anything but. And for you naysayers out there that think the Fed is going to stick this landing, carry strug this landing, think again, folks. I will say this. So what's different than what I thought it was going to be? I thought two things. The economy would be showing signs of, quote, more slowing. It's fits and starts. And I would have thought, that inflation would be abating a little bit more. So let's say I'm slightly wrong on both of those. It doesn't change the bearish thesis on the market. If anything, it potentially sucks people in and makes it a little bit worse because I'm looking right now, in one week, the Fed's probability has gone from 9 to 15% of raising rates 50 basis points at their next meeting. And actually a month ago at the end of the year, the odds of the Fed funds being 525 to 550 have raised now literally from nothing to 23%. And so we've seen major shifts here in the Fed fund futures. Yeah, well, if you think about how the stock market closed last year, sentiment couldn't have been worse. We had it closing really in a kind of somewhat depressed state. The consensus had come around, I think, in Q4 that the first half of this year was going to be really sluggish. And that was something that I think we had all thought was going to be the case at some point in early 2023, the sort of lag effects from the Fed's tightening. So quantitative tightening, and then obviously the rise in Fed funds, it didn't happen. And as soon as it became consensus, I think we all took a step back a little bit and said, well, we don't think valuations make a whole heck of a lot of sense for the S&P 500, especially where we think S&P 500 earnings are going to trend to over the course of the first half of the year. I think the speed in which we rallied in the first month six weeks or so, and we seem to be pausing a little bit here. That's the thing that caught us up. Are we wrong right now? Am I wrong for a whole host of different reasons? Sure. But I'm not wrong about what I think is happening with the dollar, with rates, with crude oil, which is also bounced here. And I think Guy has been all over this train. And I know Danny, for more than a year, has been talking about stagflation. What we're working into right now, despite unemployment where it is, despite those consumer spending numbers or retail sales numbers that we saw, I mean, we're kind of moving into an environment where financial conditions got really loose. 
They might be getting tighter. Valuations are off the charts right now. And we might actually have just pushed out the economic malaise that is the lag effect of all that tightening to maybe it's Q2 or maybe it's Q3. And if the stock market is a discounting mechanism, right now it's discounting none of that. And so the fact that we have gone from hard landing to soft landing to no landing with Fed funds to Danny's point now, if you look at the futures with a five handle on them, there's no way that the S&P 500 up seven and a half percent on the year and the NASDAQ up nearly 15% of the year, six weeks in, this is how it ends. It's not how it ends, people. It's been fun to watch this market, the resiliency of the market in the wake of what have been extraordinarily, in my opinion, hot numbers in terms of inflation data and in terms of jobs and those things. We play this game from time to time on Fast Money, and we play it here every once in a while. If you had told me, if Danny had said to me, these are what these numbers will be, where's the S&P going to be at the second or third week of February? I would have said we're easily down a few hundred handles. We're probably visiting 3,800 or thereabouts, and here we are still north of 4,100. So I admire the market's resiliency. What I don't comprehend is how people are dealing with the valuations associated with that. Again, if you were to look at an S&P, for example, trading 4,100 or thereabouts, if you say an 18 multiple, then you're assuming the market's going to come in with about $230 or so worth of earnings, which is a pipe dream. I said it last week. I'll say it again. That's probably 15% at least inflated. And an 18 multiple in this environment is at least two turns too rich. So I'm not sure what people are looking at. I understand the want to be optimistic and the want for the market to go higher. But I look at this to a certain extent as a math problem. I also look at to a certain extent that the Fed could stop tomorrow hiking rates, they're not going to lower rates anytime soon, in my opinion. And if they were, Danny, to lower rates, it's because something broke. It's not because everything is going all so well. Lael Brainer, who was vice chair of the Fed, is now going to the National Economic Council on the White House. And she was the dovish person over there, right? Mm -hmm. So if anything, everything between the PPI, the CPI, and all the other stuff is his point a little bit more hawkish. And Again, we're kind of through earnings season here. So now you're going to rely on what? You're going back to the macro factors, inner quarter updates from companies, conferences on people speaking. I will say one thing. The consumer, I said this six months ago, three months ago, never underestimate the U.S. consumer the same way, Guy, mm -hmm. that you underestimated Patrick Mahomes last week. Never <laughs> underestimate the U.S. consumer and what they are spending right now on travel. I mean, look at Royal Caribbean, look at Marriott, look at Delta, look at what they're saying. And they are booking trips left and right. They really, truly are. God bless them. And I'm thinking in the back of my mind, you know what? Obviously, they're still coming out of COVID and they want to have life experiences. But I swear, the moral hazard, it feels like they're spending money thinking that the Fed somehow or the government will bail them out if things get hard again. And that's the only thing I can think of right now because it feels a little bit reckless to me right now. Well, some of the numbers we're seeing in terms of travel, in terms of entertainment, in terms of dining out, I mean, we're at pre-COVID levels. And I like the way you snuck in that Patrick Mahomes. Never did I underestimate Patrick. I have a great deal of respect and admiration for him. What I said incorrectly last week was I thought the Eagles were the best team wire to wire. I thought people were underestimating them, and I thought they were going to throttle the Chiefs. And at halftime, Danny, I know it. We didn't talk, but you were saying to yourself, son of a bitch, he's going to be right again. Wrong. When the Eagles were up 10 and Mahomes was limping into the dressing room, you're like, he's going to be right. With that said, quickly, I say this all the time. I never underestimate the U.S. consumers want to spend. I have said that 100 times on Fast Money, and I'll say it here again on our podcast. What I do take into consideration is the fact that they probably shouldn't be spending in an environment where companies are laying people off, interest rates are going higher, inflation is still a problem, and balance sheets, everybody talks about the U.S. consumer's balance sheet. Guess what? We are now markedly north of $5 trillion in consumer debt here in the United States. So the spending has been nonstop. Listen to the credit card companies, what's going on with spending. And the rates that people are carrying, if they're carrying a balance on their credit cards, haven't been this high in decades. And so you're about to experience low savings rates, high rates, what that means. So after this kind of spending is over or it slows down a little bit, I think there'll be somewhat of a reckoning.
So this week is basically the one-year anniversary of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And I think for a lot of investors, I think it's interesting to think about the NASDAQ topped out in late 2021 when the Fed said they were going to change their tune on the inflation being transitory. So I think investors in those long-duration, high-valuation assets started selling. We know that. And that correction started in 2021. You know, the S&P 500, which a lot of people were crowding into a lot of those mega cap predominantly tech names, but we also saw a rotation into some other, I guess, deemed to be defensive sort of names. That kept the S&P levitating a little bit. So we made an all-time high in the first week of January. So we think about here we are now, a year later, with Fed funds literally up 5% in one year, which is just truly astounding. Every other headline, guys, is about China, is about the economic cold war that we're in that's getting hotter. We are in a dialed up geopolitical, like just think about it from a foreign policy standpoint. I don't think things have been as tense with China in a very long time. And these things work together. And so I guess when I think about this headline that the Chinese put Lockheed Martin in a subsidiary of Raytheon on their unreliable entities list, they're finding them. We've talked about Apple and Tesla and a whole host of other U.S. multinationals, largely non-digital companies that are relying on China for manufacturing, relying on Chinese consumers for consumption. In the case of Tesla, relying on access to rare earth materials and the like. Guy, we talked about it a little bit on Fast Money the other night. That deal that Ford did, they're going to invest $3.5 billion with a company called CATL out of China, which is the largest battery company for EVs in the world. They have like 37% market share. And the headline is, and we all saw this coming, is that the Chinese are going to scrutinize that deal, a technology transfer deal, the sort of the deals that the Chinese are super aggressive with about our companies looking to do business in China. So this situation with China is not getting any better. And I'm just going to bookend this point here is that we are, again, a year on from that thing, that situation in Ukraine, which is not getting any better. And that's the thing that blew out inflation expectations when you think about commodities. So it was natural gas, it was oil. And then if you think about just how much more serious the situation could be with China, if you throw in chips, if you throw in chip manufacturing, if you throw in all of the disconnections that we saw with supply chains and access to chips, I mean, this could be a much worse situation that we saw in the first half of 2022 from a geopolitical standpoint. No question about it. We mentioned this last week as well. You know, the irony of people being up in arms from these balloons floating across continental United States, which by the way, I'm sure that they have satellites to do exactly that. But I understand why people would get all exorcised seeing these balloons, but those same people that are seemingly losing their mind are the same people that go to their Apple devices and pull up TikTok and post a video, and those are the greatest spying device in the history of mankind. So the irony isn't lost on me. But I will say this, Dan, as well. I think you're right to bring it up. U.S.-China relations are clearly headed in the wrong direction. They're probably the worst they've been in decades, quite frankly. And I don't know what changes anytime soon. There's not going to be a detente. Personally, I think things will continue to escalate. I don't want that to happen. I'm just sort of reading the tea leaves here. And if you think this China Lockheed Martin Raytheon thing is the first and last, think again. And we've brought this up, but it's worth mentioning once again. Apple had to pull out of Russia. Starbucks, McDonald's absolutely had to do it. But Russia is a fly on their ass. But they set that precedent. God forbid China were to do something with Taiwan or escalate somewhere and do something untoward. Apple, Starbucks, McDonald's is going to have to act in kind. They're going to have to do the same thing. If they were to do it, it's going to be extraordinarily detrimental to their stocks and to their earnings. And more importantly, if they don't do it, if they remain there, I think that could be even worse for them on the public relations front. Right. And that's just from public relations on our side of things. I mean, if we start going tit for tat with the Chinese on our companies, our services, our products with theirs, it's ultimately going to get to these things. We know that Elon Musk, Tim Cook have been very quiet about a whole host of issues, starting with human rights, environmental stuff. I mean, the list goes on and on and on because China is such an important market. But it's really important to remember Both of these companies are having very difficult periods in China right now, and both of these companies have market share for their main products, that would be EVs for Tesla, phones for Apple, less than 10% in those companies. So they're national, they're a local domestic 
manufacturers of both of their main products that do much better. So for the Chinese, I just think that at some point they have cut off access to our digital companies to their consumers it wouldn't be hard for them to do the same as it relates to let's say hardware but the big difference here is manufacturing so they are employing lots of people manufacturing and danny i'd love to kick the ball to your court i mean you and i were talking offline earlier today i mean the headlines out of tesla when you think about the fact that they're shutting down their Shanghai Gigafactory for the end of the month. They made that announcement. NHTSA announcement about the recall of 363,000 cars on the full self-driving. And then yesterday, the Gigafactory in Buffalo, where they work on the full self-driving, they announced that they're going to unionize and Tesla goes and they fired dozens of workers who are leading the charge on that. I mean, could the news get any worse? Now, there is one positive headline. I think that the fact that they're doing this deal, I guess it's with the White House has something to do with the IRA for them potentially opening up their charging station network to non-Tesla cars. Fantastic. I actually think that's a really good headline. But the other three headlines are really nasty. So let's go back to China for a second. We've gone from a euphoric China is reopening, getting past COVID trade and what that means for the markets globally. Yay. Now we've been talking about was going to be a geopolitical issue that had bipartisan support. It's going to come to the forefront here, and it certainly is. And if anyone thinks that we're not reliant on China, to your point you made, Dan, we still are. There's still tons of manufacturing jobs. We've talked about moving a lot of jobs back over here, and we are slowly doing it, but there's still an important partner. And I would throw in The OPEC plus comments today and the reason oil has been firming here is that they're going to maintain the current production status because they think they're even keeled here. So the price of oil is certainly holding, if not going to move higher. And so that's another element of geopolitical risk as it relates to Tesla. I mean, the fact that it's rallied 100 percent is really mind boggling to me. And when I say 100 percent, I'm really talking about call it 350 billion dollar in valuation to come back on, which I don't think there's really been any quote good news. That being said, it was oversold probably for a period of time and it's still not trading on fundamentals. So shorting a stock on valuation is always a dangerous thing. And it is amazing how much it gets through. And he's still pointing, obviously, must to this March 1st day where he has these events and he unleashes product day and all this stuff. And it'll come and go with a a man in a robot suit falling down a stage, or it'll come and go with a glass in the cyber truck being hit by a rock or whatever. But who cares? It's laughable at this point. It is what it is. I'll stay patient there. So yes, I've seen worse news, but you're right, Dan, the confluence of events in conjunction with the China news coming out certainly should be worrisome for bulls out there in Tesla. So I always say you need to bookmark certain days or certain weeks. And I think in terms of Tesla, this could be one of those weeks you want to bookmark. And again, just look at the action on Thursday. The stock traded basically $218, the highest level we've seen in quite some time. I had been looking for sort of a gap fill type situation to 225, which oddly enough comes in right around the 200-day moving average. Didn't get there, but it's going to be a day on Thursday where we trade Almost two times normal volume-ish, traded higher, reversed, went a little bit lower. This is one of those days you want to look at because, again, I thought you fade the stock into earnings. The stock was trading, I think, 145 to 150 at that time. That clearly was incorrect. But to Danny's point, a stock that has now rallied more than 100% from the lows we saw in October, seemingly on nothing other than an earnings report, which was fine. And the fact that maybe Elon Musk is done selling stock vis-a-vis the Twitter purchase, yeah, I guess. But to double in price over that short period of time on a broader market, by the way, which might be starting to turn, I think you got to look at this very closely now. Yeah, I'll just say this. I mean, if I wasn't short the stock, which I am, and I've been wrong for a couple of weeks now in a big way, I mean, to me, the technicals with the headlines, with the anticipation of this March 1st investor day, I think is really interesting. And Guy, you bring up that last point about Elon being done selling stock. He still has on the hook for all of that debt that will be resetting at higher interest levels. And he was selling stock south of 150 about a month and a half ago. Why the hell, aside from the fact that he said he wasn't going to sell any more stock, would he not sell more stock to pay down that debt? Because things over there at Twitter are not particularly great. And the other headline, I guess, out of him is that earlier in this week, he mentioned that he will not be replacing himself as CEO until, let's say, the end of this year at the earliest. And when you put all that together, to me, those are all of the sort of headwinds that were weighing on Tesla late last year when it dropped from $300 in 
in late September to $100 in early January. So to me, I suspect he will be selling stock again soon. I suspect that the March 1st investor day is going to be a bit of a dud. I suspect that whatever pickup they had after their price cuts, some of those models that were doing poorly into the end of Q4, maybe they got those sales back. But China's still weak. And I just kind of feel like this is a great entry point on the short side because I don't think the news gets better in the near term. And let me just tell you this. If all those no landing, soft landing predictions are wrong and we are correct that the situation with China only gets dialed up, this is going to be a really difficult six month period from here on out for Tesla. Yeah, and it's interesting. So if you're looking for a catalyst in terms of the broader market, Danny correctly said earnings season is effectively over, and he's right. Although on February 22nd, so next week, we're going to hear from NVIDIA, a stock that has now rallied over 100% since the lows it put in a few months ago, a stock that is now trading approximately 19 times revenue, probably close to 55 times or so forward earnings, a stock that went from reasonably valued a few months ago to once again, extraordinarily expensive in this environment. So keep your eyes open because I am hard pressed to put forth a set of circumstances where this stock can build upon the gains we've seen over the last few months. So if you're looking for a potential market moving catalyst, NVIDIA has been the poster child both to the downside and the upside, that one I'm looking at next week. I will say just in general, the market is starting to become a little bit smarter and more cynical. Shopify obviously lost $624 million, lost 49 cents a share. However, on an adjusted basis, they made seven cents, which is a beat, but people kind of saw right through that. So I think the quality of earnings is going to start to matter more. Maybe obviously we're kind of through the fourth quarter reporting, but first will matter. Then one other thing, just the fact that I said there'd be M&A in the energy sector. I didn't know that the energy sector would be buying travel centers, obviously convenience stores, but look at the BP deal for travel center symbol TA, which by the way, obviously didn't leak. I guess Barry Dealer didn't have that information, but a $1.3 billion deal and the stock is up 71% today. So again, there's still value out there in certain things. And that obviously is a trend and people want charging stations, BP looking to expand their business away just from gasoline. So I thought that was an interesting deal as well, Dan. So, Danny, it's interesting you bring up the Shopify, and I love the gap versus adjusted, so the headline of that. But this is a stock that's down 15% on the day. Uh, This is Thursday, the day after they reported those earnings and gave that disappointing guidance. And I also think it's funny because I'm staring at my fact set machine, and it is a sea of red. But there are a handful of stocks that stick out like a sore thumb. Twilio recently cut 17% of their workforce. Stock is up 15% after their earnings and guidance. Fastly, a company that was, I think the stock was down like 90% from its highs. It's up 16.5% today. Roku up 12%. This was also a stock that was down 85% from its highs. This is at its lows just recently. So some of these stocks reacting, I think they're sending the wrong signal in a way. It's just kind of, this is the final capitulation. I think some people who have been short some of these names and not believing the sorts of move that these stocks have had off the lows. Fastly's up 100%. Twilio's up 58%. This is on the year. Roku's up 82%. Still down 70 some percent from their highs. This feels like the last gasp of this bear market rally, in my opinion. And I'll make one last point, Danny, if you're also looking, again, Thursday into the close, Carvana down 13%, Upstart down 11%, Affirm down 8%, Coinbase down 5.5%. The meat, Some of these other meme names that you watch also getting hit here. So I think this is kind of interesting. It's all coming together. And now finally, Tesla's getting hit down 5.5% on that NHTSA headline, because I don't know about you guys. I was sitting there staring at those headlines, scrolling on my fax set machine and wondering why that stock wasn't being hit. And it seems like someone just hit the sell button. Let me add one more name to this product mix, and that, of course, would be the great Facebook. And again, let me emphasize that I was the one that said into earnings, given the run the stock had had from that mid-80s level to a certain 145, 150, I said the correct thing to do, the disciplined thing to do is to take money off the table, get out of the stock into their earnings release. That proved to be incorrect as the stock obviously had a huge gap to the upside. Subsequently, we said... There is a real chance here for what we call in the business a gap island reversal or for you candlestick fans out there, not candlestick park, Danny, candlesticks in terms of doji stars and hammers and those types of things, you had a potential for a doji star reversal. So I encourage you folks to pull up your Google machine or your fact set machine and check out what we just put in. The opening on Thursday, that lower opening created that island that I've been talking about. And 
if Facebook starts to sell off in a meaningful way, more and more people are going to start to talk about it. And you could see that stock, which found a home in the 140s for a period of time, right back there. So there are a number of stocks out there that have acted that way. As a matter of fact, Dan, earlier this week, Carter Worth and I did a market call where we brought up a few of them. I think you were in Philadelphia watching the Sixers defeat the Cavaliers of Cleveland. An epic day for you, by the way, which we can get into detail or not. Nah. But the market is certainly setting up in very odd ways right now. Let's just hit this one thing. And Danny, I'm curious if you found this situation interesting. So Microsoft did this investment in OpenAI, which was meant to be at the time, this was a few years ago, a nonprofit. And it was all of these major Silicon Valley thought leaders and thinking about a responsible AI solution. And it was basically a nonprofit. They invested a billion dollars. And at the time, part of that investment was to get this OpenAI using their cloud, Azure. And so it just took the world by storm. We've talked about it a little bit on our pods, this chat GPT that was introduced late last year. And it was one of the quickest adoptions by consumers of an app. I think they got to like 30 million in a couple months or something like that. It was doing all these amazing things. And then Microsoft last week, they held this event in Redmond, Washington, and they unveiled this and how they're going to use open AI for search in their Bing, their Bing that has no market share versus Google or no notable market share at all as it relates in search. And the thing did really well and the stock rallied a bunch to the tune of, let's say, $50 billion or something like that. On the flip side of that, Google, which owns search advertising as far as market share, they rushed out an announcement about their BARD. This is their large language model that was going to be the thing that they embed in Google search. And it did very poorly at an event in Paris. And that stock sold off 10%. This is a $1.2 trillion market cap company. So almost to the equal amount of what Microsoft had gained. Well, Kevin Ruse, New York Times, he's been reporting on this great podcast, Hard Fork, he did with Casey Newton from The Platformer, and they've been talking about Microsoft. Clearly, this is something that it's a superior product right now to Google, but they're talking about how this could crush Google's margins. And we're not going to go into detail right now about the how and why. But a week later, after all of this, Kevin Ruse, the same guy who was praising this on The Hard Fork, and he went to Redmond, Washington, and he watched he put out a column in the New York Times today on Thursday. We're going to have him actually guy on Fast Money tonight talking about how this AI bot that he's using for Bing, and there is a wait list right now, has basically gone rogue. And we'll put the column in our show notes here. But it's really interesting. So Microsoft's starting to sell off a little bit here. So I find these situations curious. I don't think there's going to be meaningful impact right now as both of these products are in beta. But there were huge market cap moves in both of these names, two of the largest names in the entire market. Again, it's making me think we are getting to an overly frothy place in the markets right now. Yeah, we talked about it for the last couple of weeks, this whole GPT thing and the market cap associated with these add-on products and then how Google got hit just on a bad live performance of it. But in the middle of all of this, let's take a step back. There's still the big tech crackdown in Washington. Obviously, that's an overhang. And then today, the YouTube CEO stepped down in the middle of all of this. And so we know there's issues within these companies. They're good companies in general, but you're right. They got overbought on this excitement and bing, and all this stuff at Microsoft, resurrecting of Bing, I should say. So yeah, listen, par for the course on what we've seen in the first six weeks of the market. Felt a little bit like the last gasp, to your point, Dan, of dot-com time period. And listen, we've kind of been saying this, to be fair, for the last four or five weeks that, oh, this is the weekend. It hasn't been. So let's see how it plays out. Let's see what kind of juice is kind of left in this market. And if it's not chat GPT, maybe it's something else that people get excited about. I mean, I say that tongue in cheek, but I think you follow my train of thought. And at the end of the day, I think we do have an overbought situation and things will start to come down. I hear the word juice. And of course, I think of the great Robert Plant, who famously said, squeeze my lemon till the juice runs down my leg. Again, I don't need to get into great detail there. But I'm going to ask you a question, Danny, and I'm begging you not to be wonky with this one, okay? Speak to me like a child for you Fast Money fans out there from yesteryear. There is something going on in the Japanese bond market. I am telling you, I've been reading about it. I've been watching it. I can't put my finger on it. I think I understand it. To the earlier comment you made about Bitcoin, I think part of the rise in Bitcoin is predicated on what's going on and JGBs and the fact that the Bank of Japan is doing everything they can to sort of stem the tide and hold on dearly. I mean, they did it with an intervention in their currency months ago. They did it again and their bond market was effectively an intervention in their currency again. But the wheels are coming off the bus. And I think that's going to have far-reaching effects that people are not 
paying close enough attention to. Yeah, new head of the Bank of Japan comes in, supposed to be dovish, obviously. It's interesting. We talked about before, what is the yen carry trade? Yen being weak versus the dollar and people leverage that trade to the hills. That being said, Japan can't really afford with this type of inflation to have the yen be weak because they still import many, many things on a net basis. They export certain things, but overall, they're hurt by the fact that the yen is weak. So what have they been doing? We just saw the foreign report of the sell of U.S. treasuries. Both China and Japan actually have been selling U.S. treasuries to kind of shore up their currencies. They have some ammunition there, Guy, but not a ton. At some point, something's got to give here. And if the yen weakens back towards, and when I say weaken people out there, when you see it go from 132 to 140 to 150, that's weakening. Obviously, Rizal had been strong in general, and they've been trying to control their yields. And specifically, what you're talking about, Guy, is the 10-year yield, which has been capped here at 50 basis points, 0.5%. And it's going to start to look awkward if inflation keeps pumping up in Japan and yields around that 10-year <laughs> start to go up. It's pretty obvious what they're trying to do. But at some point, Guy, I guess he's just they're going to run out of ammunition. And I do believe it could be the canary in the coal mine. You just mentioned Bitcoin. And again, you got to pull up this one-year chart and we'll throw one in the show notes here. This thing touched 25,250 or so. It was the highest level it's been in since late last spring. And it's interesting because, again, there was a breakdown level in June at 25,000. It got back up there after getting down to maybe 17,000 or so. That was in August. And then it failed again, made a new low just above 15,000. And here we are on a week where There's no shortage of Fed officials talking about higher rates for longer, and they've just been saying it in the wake of this hotter than expected economic data. On what planet should Bitcoin be rallying off of that? To me, it absolutely makes no sense. So I think it just hit a really interesting technical level. And when you think about just the way that Bitcoin has moved from about 15 and a half thousand to 25 and a quarter thousand in about two months or so doesn't make a whole heck of a lot of sense, especially when you consider what the Fed is saying about rates. And Guy, you've said this, I think, very aptly for the course of, let's say, the last year as this thing was trying to bottom out under 20,000 or so. The thing that kind of motivate Bitcoin once again to the upside is going to be a pivot by the Fed to an easier monetary policy. And that doesn't seem to be on the table right now. I mean, maybe some of the geopolitical risk is working way into these cryptos. But I will say this, I find it interesting that Tether is now working with Kenner Fitzgerald to monitor, I guess, or manage their $39 billion portfolio bond. So that'll be interesting to see. I guess they're really trying to make themselves transparent, but I did see that as well. And so, Dan, I don't know if that had a positive impact that they're willing to work with a reputable US broker to kind of do that, but there was something else was out there as well. And that's one of the things I think that's gone on is that the change in sentiment from late last year when it seemed like every headline on every major financial publication had to do with SBF or STX. And we turned the page here in January and people just want to forget. And the SEC shut down the staking business of one of these exchanges, crack and charged them a large fine. So for whatever reason, I feel like a lot of investors have just swept a lot of really bad news under the rug because you can't tell me that 2022 was just capped with all of this fraud that went on in this DeFi in and around all of these other crypto projects and that we just turn the page into 2023 and it's over. That's not happening, people. So to me, I just think this ramp in Bitcoin this year is one of those things that it's not something that most investors can fade. But when you look at that move, I think you should expect to see this thing back near its 200 day moving average of 20,000 and possibly as low as that 2019 high of 13,000 over the coming months, because I think higher for longer. HFL people is going to be the thing that deflates a lot of the hopium that exists in all of these markets that we've been talking about for the last half an hour. You are getting closer to some type of regulation. You could look at that as a negative. You could look at that as a positive. So the irony to me has always been that crypto was born of no regulation, no government can touch it yet. They're craving it now because they need guardrails in order to have a legitimate business. And so maybe we're headed a little bit closer to that, Dan, and people feel a little more confident. Again, I'm totally with you. I'm not the crypto guy and I never was. So wrong person. But if you were trying to have me paint a reason why these things are up and holding up, that's what I would say. Danny, your call on the Chiefs of Kansas City winning the Super Bowl was correct. You did well for yourself. I and would the get, over. I would, and the over. And, and the, the over. over. If you, you. Of course, you got to mention that. By the way, that was a cigar over, as they say. I mean, that sucker was over <laughs> in the third quarter. So bully for you, number one. Given that, I would put your efforts in this season of the NFL 
C plus by your standards at best. Any other grade you want to give yourself, you know it's sort of grade inflation. D. Number three, Dan mentioned Turning the Page. Of course, the great Bob Seger sang that song. It was covered by Metallica, I believe, in 1996 on an album where they also covered the great song Tuesday's Gone by Leonard Skinnerd. When we come back, best-selling author Bethany McLean, you know her from The Smartest Guys in the Room and All the Devils Are Here. Well, Danny and I are going to have a great conversation with her, so stick around. Introducing event contracts from CME Group for individual investors who want a new, less complex way to trade some of the world's most recognized futures markets. They're smaller, lower cost, with predefined risk, Event contracts let you trade your views on daily up or down price moves in equities, gold, oil, and more. The markets you know and use every day. Take a position by choosing a side with event contracts from CME Group. Learn more at cmegroup.com slash event contracts. iConnections is the world's largest capital introduction platform in the alternative investment industry. They bring the asset management community together through a membership platform that lets allocators and managers meet and connect both physically and virtually. Over 3,000 allocators and 600 managers are part of the iConnections community, overseeing nearly $48 trillion and $16 trillion in assets, respectively. iConnections first came to our attention in 2020 during the first wave of the pandemic. That's when their first event, Funds for Food, became the largest virtual cap intro event in history. To date, they've donated nearly $2.5 million to charities. They are also the people behind the alternative investment industry's largest and most exciting in-person events. To find out more about iConnections events and members-only platform, visit iConnections.io. What's up? Guy here. Did you know FactSet is the official data provider for risk reversal media? FactSet is the key to all of our analysis. It's not just charts. FactSet provides insight into the top headlines of the day, private markets, and sector-specific data. If you ever have issues, get help from their support team that is committed to your success. Visit FactSet.com to experience the power of FactSet and request a free trial and unlock access to the tools that matter most to you. Bethany Lee McLean is an American journalist and contributing editor for Vanity Fair magazine. She is known for her writing on the Enron scandal and the 2008 financial crisis. Previous assignments include editor-at-large, columnist for Fortune, and a contributor to Slate. So, Bethany, I have read your books. I am extraordinarily familiar with your work. And the more and more I think about it and the more I sort of dig down, Are there any experts in anything? I mean, that's not meant to be a glib question, but the more and more we hear from experts, the more we learn that they don't know nearly as much as they think they do. And the problem is they think they're the enlightened and they wind up being wrong, I would say, the majority of the time. Yeah, isn't that interesting? And the louder they are about their proclamations, it seems, the more often that they're wrong. There's this guy named Martin Gurry, who's a former CIA analyst who wrote a book in 2016, and I'm embarrassed to admit I'm blanking on the name of it. But he points out the limits of expertise in a world of wash in information, because people can know enough to start undercutting the supposed expertise. I think another component of it is that the world is just increasingly complicated. And so the expertise of one institution after another keeps being undermined from the CDC in the early stages of the pandemic to the Fed in these late stages of the pandemic. And it's pretty shocking. It's extraordinarily shocking. And let's drill down on the Fed just a little bit. I know Danny has thoughts on this as well. But the fact that as a nation, and quite frankly, if you look at it as a global economy, we put the fate in the hands of predominantly men, so I will say a bunch of men, there are obviously some women, that think they know more than everybody else, that are schooled in academia, that somehow, in my opinion, tune out what's going on in the real world, and we're forced to adhere to their policies. And what I find equally fascinating is they are trying to correct the mistake that they created in the first place. And there's just something baffling about that to me. So speak to that. 
it's really interesting. I think some part of it is also hindsight bias, the way in which it shapes how we think. Because inflation didn't materialize in the decade after the financial crisis, everyone started to think it can't materialize now, even though everything was different. And I was struck by a comment by Nancy Pelosi when they were passing the big stimulus. She relayed how Powell said to her, go big, go really, really big, because interest rates are so low. And it's stunning that no one saw the combination of monetary stimulus and fiscal stimulus what exactly that might do. And it's interesting that a lot of people in the market saw it. And so that became one of the interesting things was that people in the market saw that inflation was coming and the Fed didn't. And then you also had this, I think what you were alluding to by the Fed fixing, well, problems of its own creation was also this decade of asset price inflation that preceded the pandemic and then was exacerbated by the Fed's mammoth response in the pandemic. So asset prices could only go up. And now we've got this world awash in debt, corporate debt, government debt, all kinds of debt. And that wasn't inevitable. It didn't have to be that way. So there's been two non-economists that have chaired the Fed in the last 50 years. William Miller and no guy, not from almost famous William Miller, and Jerome Powell, who's here now, right? I want to get your thoughts on that. I also want to talk about the many books that you've written, The Smartest Guys in the Room or The Dumbest Guys in the Room, however you want to look at it. All the devils are here, obviously. So you've had a great chronology of crises that come and go, big ones, ones that are ongoing and so forth. So want to get your thoughts on if you have any comments on a non-economist running the Fed, if you even care about that. But secondly, what do you think your next book is going to be if you had to guess? Well, I do have thoughts on a non-economist running the Fed, although I think what is surprising is how it's not that different than an economist running by the Fed. And I think that's because the Fed is such an institution with such hierarchy and institutional weight, and the economists run the Fed. So it almost doesn't matter if it's a non-economist sitting at the top, the economists run the Fed. And I was thinking about this in light of your previous question too. Lord Mervyn King, who was the former governor of the Bank of England, has talked a lot about this, so I'm plagiarizing him in some ways. But it's the limitations of models and the way in which academic economists increasingly rely upon models. And the model purports to offer truth with a capital T. And I think we see that in all aspects of life. It was true at the start of the pandemic with models. The model says this, and it's true inside the Fed. The model says this. And the reality is a model is just a hypothesis. It's a way of framing the question so that then you can run the real world evidence coming in against the framing of the question and say, oh, this is how it's actually working. But a model is never truth with a capital T. And I think it's a broader aspect of our world that with increasing complexity, we crave the simplicity of models more and more. And I think that's part of the problem. But I don't think it's just the academics running the Fed. I think it exists throughout layers of our world. In terms of books, Joan O'Sara and I have been working on a book about the pandemic for the last almost three years. (laughs) It's been really, really, really difficult. I think we are finally close to getting done. It's coming out next fall, so we're going to have to finish whether we like it or not. But I think it would have been helpful if we had known what we were writing about when we started working on the book. And as it turns out, we didn't. I could listen to you talk all day. You just said a word that resonated with me. It was simplicity. And I want to drill down on that because one of my fears, and I am not saying I'm some enlightened person, by no stretch am I putting my IQ up against yours or Danny's or anybody else for that matter. But I like to think there's a level of rigor with which I do things. Yet simplicity is really what this whole nation seems to be about right now. The attention span, maybe of five or six seconds, the cult of personality, just taking things at face value, all those things I think are leading us down an extraordinarily dangerous path. And the lack of rigor and this thirst for simplicity, I think could be sort of the undoing of the United States in some ways. Is there some truth to that? I think it's interesting because at the same time, you want simplicity. You want to arrive at simplicity. You want to arrive at clarity. Maybe that's what I'm going for, is that what we should be searching for is clarity, not simplicity. And clarity and simplicity aren't the same thing. And I think you're right that we do have this crazy need for simplicity. And part of it is the hot take culture. You have to have a take when something happens. And if you do, there's no room for complexity and there's no room for clarity. It's just the hot take of the moment. And then we don't have a lot of patience for going back and looking at that. And I think some people on Twitter have written and talked about this a fair amount, but I also think in an increasingly secular world, we find religion in other places. And so because we find religion in our political affiliations, it's almost as dismissive as somebody used to be against somebody of a different religion back in the day. 
I was talking to a friend of mine and he made the comment, he was Jewish and said, I would not have wanted my daughter to marry a Catholic, but now I'd rather have her marry a Catholic than a Republican. It's just this very simplistic identification that we're all after. I was shocked in the early stages of the pandemic when I was somewhat skeptical of lockdowns and of keeping kids out of the school. The number of supposedly smart people who said to me, I didn't know you were a Trump voter. And I was like, wait, when did one thing have anything to do with the other? Why can't you have one view on one thing and another view on another thing? Why do they all have to be lumped into a category? So just applying common sense in general, which is I think is what we're talking about, keep things sensible in general. Let's talk about FTX. A lot of people always were skeptical about not just crypto in general, but maybe FTX specifically. I know you have thoughts there. I want to get your thoughts on that as well as what's going on in Washington with big tech and the breaking up potentially of big tech there. On FTX, I think what's the most interesting thing about it to me is I have this framework basically for business gone wrong, white collar wrongdoing, in which it rarely starts with intent to defraud. It usually is the proverbial slippery slope. And rarely are characters 100% venal and corrupt. It's usually some mixture of venality, desperation, rationalization, self-delusion, very human characteristics. And so the big question for me about the FTX story is, is this proof? Is this evidence of my rule or my framework? Or is it actually the exception to the rule? And that if you believe the two people who have pled guilty, who are very close to Sam Bankman-Fried, it was deliberate and it was clear-cut fraud. Yet, Sam Bankman-Fried himself is still pleading innocent. So is this a legal strategy or is there actually a really deep question here about what it is that went wrong? And I thought there's an interesting comparable in the Enron story because that was a really, really difficult case to prove. And in the end, at least some of it hung on the jury believing Andy Fasto when he said there was this agreement called Global Galactic that required Enron to provide Andy Fasto's funds with a return and that it was signed by Andy Fasto and Jeff Skilling. And that made the accounting not legal and was part of what led to Skilling's conviction. And it was Andy Fasto's word that Global Galactic existed. And in this case, I read this great Bloomberg story about Gary Wang, SBF's number two. And at the end of the piece, it recounts how Wang told prosecutors that Bankman-Fried told him to change the code so that they could divert Alameda's funds and use customer funds in order to support Alameda. And if there's not a record of that, some of this might hinge on who a jury decides in the end to believe. So I thought that was an interesting parallel for what it's worth. On the break of a big tech, this case against Google, I've been surprised that it hasn't gotten more attention because it's a really, really substantive look at how the ad tech market works. I frankly had to read the case three times before I even had a clue, and I'm still not sure I have that much of a clue. But there is some pretty explicit claims in there, including this agreement between Facebook and Google called Jedi Blue that looks like a violation of law. Certainly the government is spinning it that way. I wonder again, with historical parallels, though, if the government is going after Google at a time when it no longer matters anymore. In other words, like with Microsoft, by the time the government went after Microsoft, Microsoft was already losing its monopoly. And now with ChatGBT, is Google on the brink of losing its monopoly anyway? It'll be interesting to see if this case takes on the weight that the Microsoft case did all those years ago. Last time we chatted with you, and it was September, Danny, of 21, I believe, if memory serves, you know, we talked about this cult of personality. And if you look at the cap table of Elizabeth Holmes, for example, Theranos. If you look at the cap table, I'm sure of FTX, these were some extraordinarily, and I'm using air quotes here, folks, sophisticated investors that bought into these things. And again, it gets back to my word that I used before, rigor. These are, again, supposedly very smart people that do their work, but clearly they were duped. And I think part of it is it's a domino effect. When investors see that XYZ is involved, they assume incorrectly that those people did their due diligence in their homework. And if they did it for me already, why do I need to do it? And Elizabeth Holmes looks the part and Sam Bankman-Fried has a pedigree and there's so much easy money around getting back to the Fed and what you were saying prior. It's all this sort of witch's brew that we have things like this. There are going to be people looking to rip people off for the rest of mankind without question. I think the magnitude of this FTX thing, which would have happened regardless, was magnified by the fact that there was so much easy money floating around. Can you speak to that rigor, easy money, and some of the perils around that? 
Yeah, well, I'm going to argue with you about one point. You said they were duped. I'm going to say it a little bit differently, which is that they duped themselves. Yes. Sorry, but you know what? I You're 100% right. So I should have chose my – words have meaning. I learned that in my Goldman Sachs years, so thank you. But please continue. But yes, it's something I've actually thought about since Valiant. I don't know if you guys remember Valiant, the big drug company that imploded a bunch of years back and lost, I don't know, I think the loss was $100 billion. It pales in comparison to some of the stuff that we've seen today. But the thing about Valiant is that some of its investors were supposedly some of the smartest people out there, Bill Ackman, Sequoia, others who are really highly regarded. And I've thought since then that one of the big fallacies is that you should do it because somebody else smart is doing it. Because smart people can either make mistakes or they can have a very different set of incentives than you do, and you cannot see clearly what their incentives are. So the idea that an acceptable part of due diligence, to your point about rigor, should be, but XYZ person believes in it, therefore I do too, is just unacceptably lazy, right? And it's going to get you in trouble. Not every time, but it's going to get you in trouble. For sure, this was part of the end of the spectacular implosion that always comes at the end of a period of extraordinarily cheap capital. And back to the damage that's been done by extraordinarily cheap capital. Now, some of it is is loss of trust. You might say people who got their heads handed to them in the cryptocurrency blow up deserved it for not doing their homework. But every time you have something like this in such spectacular form, you have a loss of trust more broadly in the business community and the culture at large. And none of this is healthy, I don't think. You were talking about private versus public companies, right? So private, FTX, Theranos, and then there's public, and you rely on the SEC and the regulators to piece some stuff out. You rely on auditors and so forth. I want to get your thoughts on a firm like Hindenburg, which uncovers fraud or tries to uncover fraud left and right, and just recently, as you know, put out a piece on Adani, the big Indian conglomerate, and exposed a lot of things that were right in front of everybody if they wanted to, quote, find them. They could have. I'm sure you admire the work that they do. And as a detective in the markets, like you and I both are, and obviously Hindenburg is, give me your thoughts there. I admire them a lot. And I think they do really detailed work. Again, that doesn't mean they're always right. You can't take somebody's name and say, okay, they say so, therefore it is so. That's, again, it's lazy. You have to do your own homework. But I'm a big fan of anything contrarian being out there and being more publicly available. I mean, you guys remember back in the day around Enron days, there were a whole group of people who were short Enron stock. But if you were an ordinary investor in Kansas, there was no way in hell you were going to know that. All you were going to know was the Wall Street research saying that Enron was a buy and that its stock was going to double in the next 24 months, you were never, ever going to have access to any of the skepticism because that skepticism was kept confined to a really, really tight circle. And so I'm a huge fan of these publicly out there short reports because guess what? Then you have a chance of being able to do your homework. And it doesn't mean they're right. It doesn't mean you have to believe them. But information is supposed to be key, right? So people who are opposed to short sellers putting information out there, but think that anyone who's long a stock should be able to go on CNBC and talk their book, that just makes no sense to me. I think that's intellectually inconsistent. Yeah, listen, if the short report is wrong, it gives the owners of the stock a huge opportunity to buy more. But I wanted to key in specifically on auditors' roles in the public companies, because they don't basically certify or stamp approval these kind of adjusted EBITDA and adjusted earnings. It's really for just gap accounting for people out there that understand what that is. And you've seen things in recent weeks, to your point about the blooms coming off the rows in these markets, something like Lyft. Lyft has been reporting the same way, but they adjust their numbers and they exclude insurance. And a lot of companies that we know exclude warranties and things like that. But it's almost as if sometimes it's in the news and investors pay attention to it. And sometimes it's not. And it feels like we're entering an era where everyone's going to start to scrutinize more. So Specifically, what is the role of an auditor, the legal role, and what is the common sense role of an auditor in this process? Well, the legal role is to certify the financial statements, right? But that doesn't always seem to work out very well, from Enron to Wirecard to some of the things we've seen with PwC lately. I mean, you would think that in a common sense, ideal world, an accountant is supposed to be a gatekeeper of sorts for investors, right? A way that investors know they can trust the audited financial statements. And yet there are too many cases of something in that process going wrong for anybody to just smile and say, well, the auditor says it's so, therefore I believe it. And I think, again, Again, that's not okay. You should be able to look at the financial statements and trust that because they're audited, you can trust that not only are they accurate, that they're telling you everything that you need to know. 
I do think once again, though, back to your points about rigor, that it is incumbent on any investor if you are relying on non-GAAP results, if you're adjusted EBITDA in the case of Lyft, it's incumbent on you to understand exactly what adjustments are being made. And there are some adjustments that are legitimate. And then there are other adjustments that you may think are not legitimate and that are being used for cookie jar accounting. And so you just have to understand what they are. When you watch different broadcasts about business and stuff, and you hear some of the talking heads, by the way, of which I am one of them, you must just sort of scream in silence when you hear a lot of these people. It must be extraordinarily frustrating. And it goes back to some of the things that Danny talks about. There's so few people that do the actual work, but the last 13 or 14 years specifically, a lot of that work is done to sort of show people some of the fallacies that are going on there, but the market continually would bail people out. And the more the market bailed people out, the more the rigorous people got drowned out. Speak to the frustration around that, because I will tell you again, I'm not putting myself into Danny Moses, Bethany McLean category at all, but it's got to be maddening at a certain point. I don't know. I don't find it maddening. I guess maybe I'm cynical enough that I find it reassuring on some level. If the world really did change so that everybody was doing detailed, thorough homework, I don't know, things would be less interesting, right? There's something to be said for just the theater of it all. But for sure, I think you're making a really important point about the last decade. I mean, if you had listened to the Fed, who was it? Tepper, who made the call, when was it? In 2011 and 2012. And he was just like, everything is a screaming buy. Look at Fed policy. Everything is only going to go up. I can't remember exactly what he said, but it was something along those lines. And he made the right call. And over the last decade plus, anybody who did homework was punished because the market didn't reward doing your homework and having an intelligent take on something the market just rewarded by. And I think that is a really unfortunate byproduct of Fed policy. But because we are, I am a little bit hammering away at the Fed here, I also think that the title of Muhammad al Aryan's book is really, really apt, which is The Only Game in Town. And that's that the Fed came to see itself as the only game in town and the only institution that could work to fix the economy because Congress was so dysfunctional. And so in the end, what we're pointing at as a failure of Fed policy is really a failure of congressional policy. In other words, if Congress had been able to come to grips with taking some sort of smart fiscal action back in the wake of the financial policy, then the Fed wouldn't have needed to be as activist as it was. Back to the SEC's role, just in general, they always wait until a stock has blown to smithereens before they really act on anything. And they think that they're protecting the retail investor by not being proactive and ruining their day when at the end of the day, they could have been proactive. Is that mindset always going to be like that at the SEC? Because every new chairman that comes in, I have hopes for, oh, they're going to be more active. Oh, they're going to do things. And to your point, back to the common sense, they rarely do anything. And so I think that investors should be or are aware that they're not really there as a safeguard, that they're more for cleanup. And you witnessed it firsthand, obviously, with Enron and everything went on. Just your thoughts on there as long as we're sticking with Washington agencies that are out there. So I haven't been close to anybody at the SEC for, I don't know, five, six, seven years. So there could have been a change there that I'm not aware of. But at least culturally in the past, it was very ingrained. The skepticism of short sellers that we alluded to earlier when we were talking about Hindenburg was very ingrained at the SEC, this idea that short sellers were trying to manipulate them by bringing them complaints about a company that was engaged in fraud, that it was all manipulation on the part of the short seller and effort by the short seller to make money, which of course it is in part, right? Which doesn't mean it's wrong. But I think that bias in the SEC that exists broadly in our markets at large, which is that somebody's great if they're talking their book on the long side, there's something icky about them if they're talking their book on the short side, really dominates at the SEC to its detriment. I think the other part though of the SEC that is a little complicated is that they do do a fair amount on tracking down the kind of small scams that defraud our elderly, especially of their money. And in a way, I would almost rather an agency that is really activist about those kind of small scale frauds than an agency that is devoting all of its resources to going after big, splashy corporate frauds. Because in the end, Theranos, it was private investors. It hurt venture capitalists. It didn't really hurt mom and pop across America. And it's mom and pop across America who need protecting. 
So I'm a little mixed on what the mission of the SEC really should be. I wouldn't want to see all of the agency's resources going to stopping big cases of corporate fraud, because that's not what's going to do the most damage to the people who need protecting the most. It just gives the most headlines. It's the splashiest thing, but I'm so with you on that point. And again, it brings me back to the Federal Reserve and the people that were hurt the most through the financial crisis was middle class and the poor. The people that were helped the most by the Federal Reserve were not those people. They were the people that held assets. Those are the people that really did well while the middle class and poor suffered. And the people that get screwed as they try to combat the inflation that they begged for for years, again, they're not the wealthy people. They're the ones that laugh at their cocktail parties about how much you're paying for a gallon of gas, but it doesn't affect their lives. It's the, once again, middle class and the poor. They get screwed on the way in and on the way out. That's sort of off topic, but it's absolutely true. It's not off topic. I think it's incredibly germane because, again, it speaks to this lack of confidence and lack of trust that people have in the experts. If the experts are screwing people's lives, and in the end, the economy really is people's lives. And if the experts are screwing with people's lives, it's eroding trust in our society more broadly. And that's that's not okay for any of us. No, it's not okay for anybody. But you know what it leads to? This is a somewhat awkward segue, but I think it makes sense. I mean, it gives rise to this whole cult of personality thing, which we have seen a great deal of. People want to be led. And if they see some person out there that's lead that's speaking their language, they will get behind that person. This we've seen it a number of times. And I'm not looking to play stock market here by any stretch of the imagination. But when you see what's going on with Elon Musk over the last however many months, what are your thoughts around it? Because I'm sure you're fascinated by him, not only as a business person, a founder, but as a human being. I am fascinated by him. He is the epitome of this thing I've talked about before, which I think I talked about on your last podcast, which is this narrow line between the visionary and the fraudster. And there's no one I can think of who sits at those twin precipices more than Elon Musk because he's both. And the reality is that every fraudster has elements of the visionary, or at least most, let's not say every, and every visionary has elements of the fraudster. And sometimes I think it's just a matter of luck and timing as to where you go down in history. I find that really fascinating about Musk. I find his overreach really fascinating that he clearly doesn't know where to stop. The idea that the Twitter deal may be his Waterloo is really interesting. I still don't know. It would be fascinating to be able to see inside his brain when when he first made the announcement that he was going to take it over. Did he do it thinking he was going to take it over? Did he do it as a joke to get attention and publicity? And did he then think that he was going to be able to get out of it only to find that Twitter's lawyers were far smarter than his lawyers? But now he's stuck with a deal that isn't a play thing because it's got so much debt. What is it, an additional billion dollars in interest expense going forward on an already unprofitable company as we head into most likely a much tougher environment? So it's going to be really interesting to see how Twitter might show a different side to Elon Musk than his fans had wanted to see beforehand. The last point I wanted to make on this front was back to your point about rigor and your point about belief in characters. Why is it that people don't want to hear contrary information? I'd always think that particularly if you're putting your money into a company like Tesla, you'd want to know everything you can about the CEO. You'd want to know that maybe they're not perfect, and you'd want to understand in what ways they're not perfect. And the amount of excoriation I've gotten for the things I've written about Musk that haven't been flattering, and I've said, no, 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 this doesn't mean Tesla is a terrible investment. This is just a side of Musk's character that you might want to be aware of because it might be germane someday. Maybe it won't be, but why wouldn't you want the information? And yet we live in this world where information that is contrary to one's thesis is regarded as a bad thing rather than as something that you should grapple with and think about and maybe be a little uncomfortable about, but ultimately use it to help you refine your thesis. May I attempt to answer that question in a non-eloquent way? I'll say this. You hear all the time people say, I want truth. I want to hear the truth. The reality is that's complete horseshit. People don't want to hear the truth. They want to hear what helps them get through the day, what helps them go to sleep at night, be able to sleep through the night and wake up in the morning. They just want to hear what reinforces their belief system, one, and what helps them get through the day, number two. And if that truth is contrary to either one of those things or flies in the face of it, they will rage against it. Even, I think, to the degree that they understand it to be true, they don't want it to be true. So I think there's some element of that going on in this, again, non-rigorous 
immediacy society that we live in. That's just my thoughts. I'm cracking up because I've said a version of this and was just saying it on the phone to a friend the other night that one of my red flags about anybody is when they say, I just want to surround myself with people who will challenge me and tell the me. Full shit. Like, no, it doesn't matter if somebody says I surround myself with people who challenge me and tell me I'm wrong. I hate it. God damn, I hate it. But I do it because I know it's important Then I believe them. But if they say I love it, I just love being challenged. Then, you know, exactly. They're full of shit. And I remember this dates back to my time at Goldman. I remember a guy I worked for my 30 years as an analyst there saying that to me. He said, nobody wants to be told they're wrong. We all love being told we're right. <laughs> it's just it's true. A person that did it successfully, and there was a book written about it, was Abraham Lincoln, who surrounded himself with his rivals. And that was a fantastic book. But you think that's happening today? Anyway, I digress. Danny, please. And I was going to say, when you're ready to write the book about Tesla, Bethany, please consider me as a potential partner with you on that. That could be really fun. We should talk about it. Per your point about rigor, I mean, part of rigor is being able to deal with the discomfort of hearing things. Part of mental fitness is being able to deal with the discomfort of hearing things you don't want to hear. It's true, not just in the business world, but across your life. You have to be able to hear things that you don't want to hear, and you have to keep up with that. It's a muscle just like the muscle you might build by going to the gym, the muscle of hearing information that isn't pleasing to you. The less you do it, the less you're going to want to do it. And so it is an important part, I think, of mental fitness or rigor or whatever you want to call it. Not a pleasant one, but nor a squats pleasant. <laughs> so let me ask you this. How exhausting is that? Because it is exhausting. And that old statement, ignorance is bliss. I hate to say it. It's absolutely true. I mean, you see people that go through life blissfully unaware of like the human condition, what's going on around them, seemingly the happiest people in the world. On a certain level, I admire those people. On a different level, I'm like, I would never want to be those people. And that torment Again, I'm not suggesting I'm enlightened by any stretch, but I think you know what I'm saying. I think when you're in touch with the human condition, when you can see both sides of arguments, when you don't live in this blissfully ignorant status, I think it makes life really difficult. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think it makes life probably more difficult, but also more interesting. And if you fear boredom above all else, as I think sometimes I do, then you'd rather be interested than be comfortable. And I guess I don't have any choice in the matter because I have a 13-year-old daughter, so I'm screwed. I'm going to hear things I don't like all day, every day. Mommy, that outfit, why are you wearing that? <laughs> Mommy, you're an idiot. <laughs> I know. I, I mean, I know Guy loves this, but it's Simon and Garfunkel, the boxer. Man, here's what he wants here. Disregards the rest. Back to the Tesla. It is the epitome. It is the poster child for what I think we are heading in in terms of what you can get away with, what people want to believe in. Instead of looking at the financials, just following a, an idol or a person around. What inning do you think we are in in the new age of, I didn't even say fraud, but just unraveling of some of these business models that have been not valued bottom up, but kind of valued on personality and just on numbers that are adjusted? Where are we right now? And do you expect names obviously we can't name yet, or I don't know what they are, but that are out there. Are they going to be plentiful, I should say? So I don't think we know the answer to that because it depends on all the factors that we're all looking at, which way the economy goes, which way Fed policy goes. The market meaning investors are so trained to believe that the Fed is going to come to their rescue if there's any kind of calamity that we may still be at inning zero because the same thing may happen all over again. And any clarion calls that we're approaching a moment of honesty and of truth may just be drowned out in a fresh wave of monetary stimulus and accommodation and easing of interest rates. And so I don't know. I think if interest rates are still where they are now in a year, we're heading toward the ninth inning. That's baseball, right? Something like that fourth quarter, ninth inning. Your sports analogies are showing your disdain for sports in general. It's not disdain, it's just ignorance. Um, anyway, if Fed funds rates are where they are now and the Fed is still continuing to tighten in a year, we're going to be in a really different environment than most people in the market have seen in their lifetimes. I think that's exactly right. If you're not following Bethany on Twitter, you're doing it wrong. It's at Bethany Mac 12 which suggests there are 11 others of you prior, I guess. I don't know. You got to read her books. I know, listen... And I think the fact that you and Danny Moses, what do they call it when people collab? Collaborating. Yeah. If you could do that on a Tesla book, shit, I'll wait online to get that sucker signed. I'll be ready. Bethany, thanks for joining us. Thank you so much for having me on. Thanks once again to CME Group, iConnections, and SoFi for sponsoring this episode of On The Tape. If you like what you heard, make sure you hit follow and leave us a review. It helps people find the show and we love hearing from you. 
You can also email us at contact at riskreversal.com. Follow and connect with us on Twitter at On The Tape Pod. On The Tape is a Risk Reversal media production. This podcast is for informational purposes only. All opinions expressed by me, Dan Nathan, Guy Adami, Danny Moses, and any other participants are solely our opinions and should not be relied upon for specific investment decisions. (laughs) 